Hercules ROV is about 5,500 pounds. It's a lot of force for that crane to lift. Just stop pulling on it. Estimated dive time today is about an, uh, an hour and 50 minutes. Or descent time, I should say. Yes, this sounds good. Good, thank you. I'll quickly we'll change this. Dive time today is expected to be about 12 hours total, and we should hopefully cover about 2.2 kilometers of seafloor along our path. Our main dive objectives are to um, collect some rock samples so we can understand the history of the seamount. We're going to uh, also collect rock samples for examining microbes and mineral content in them. We'll be collecting water samples for microbial characterization and eDNA studies. And we may also uh, collect some animal specimens as needed. have a, a wish list of species that we're looking for. Yes.
This is an audio slate for dive number H1917. Uh, the time in UTC is 22.28.11. Mark. Kylie, it's having me fire the dive salvo in the checklist, so I'm, it might pop break those out again for a second, but I'll bring them back if they do. Oh, you, did, you got it? I'll stop, 5-0, right you guys ready for control? Gotcha. As, you, as long as it got, yeah. This is control van, yes we are. It's in an odd order over here. Okay, you got it, thanks for going off comps. Copy that, thank you. Station, uh, captain, going off radio comms. Roger that, Captain. Thank you. Front row, is that a good time to do some introductions now? I don't know if they're listening to SPL. Oh. Jess, are you listening to SPL? Sorry, what was that? Were you listening to SPL? No, I wasn't, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, Chris asked if it was a good time to do some, some intros for oh. the front row. Yeah, we are we are in a 
a nice stable position now. So you guys are all clear to do your intros. Front row, will you start? Yeah, let's start with the nav. Oh, do you want to introduce yourself on SPL, Suleiman? Okay, I'm on SPL now. I think they want to do introductions. Okay, starting from me, uh, I'm Suleiman Al Sibani, and uh, I'm a navigator over here, uh, trying to give the help to the pilots. That's all. Thank you. Um, I'm Jess Sandoval. I'm the Herc pilot for this watch. I'm sitting next to Kylie Pasternak. I am Atalanta for this watch. Sitting next to Brett Parker. <laughs> I'm a video for this watch. Um, sitting in front too. <laughs> I'm sitting, <laughs> sitting next to the door. <laughs> and behind Brett, I am Christopher Klaus. I'm the science communication fellow for this watch. Hi, everyone. I'm Justin Umholtz, and I'm the guest educator representative of Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument on this watch. All right. I'm Belle Finlayson. I'm uh, the lead scientist for this watch and a uh, resident rock enthusiast. <laughs> But also very understanding rock enthusiast, bio <laughs> bio understanding rock enthusiast. Trying to. Um, and I'm Leela Bellucci. I am sitting in the data logger seat on this watch, just logging all the data. These are descending right now at a rate of about 20 meters per minute. We should reach the bottom uh, in just under two hours, and we'll be hitting a depth of 2,200 meters on this leg, starting there and ascending uh, as we travel linearly 2.2 kilometers. We'll be ascending about 200 meters before we ascend and recover our ROVs. a lot of questions 
this last week about the colors of organisms. And we have another one uh, wondering why the fish down uh, in the benthic environment seem to be more monochrome while a lot of the other uh, invertebrates have bright colors. Let's see, I thought Steve gave a great explanation of that. Let me find that in our chat. It may take me a minute. It's all right. Bridge, this is Nav. Can we move the ship on bearing zero, well, six, zero, 20 meters, please? Thank you. Similar to with the inverts, we don't know that they're not fluorescing at all. So they might they might be fluorescing, a little like they, we found sharks that fluoresce in the deep sea. Not we, but the big science we. <laughs> Yeah, if I remember correctly, Leela, it was um, related to fluorescence or bioluminescence that we... That, that was for the inverts, yeah, yeah. that, that they're, they might also be fluorescing. But for fish, there could be all kinds of like prey avoidance tactics that they use fluorescence for or, um, or a predator avoidance yes, bridge. tactics or prey lure tactics. Does it help with any social behaviors? Yeah, no worries. It's just one move, so no worries, yes. There are definitely patterns that could help with, like, locating a mate, or like, like signal patterns. Okay, cool. I know a number of fish have symbiotic protists that live inside of them. That it isn't the fish that actually glows, it's the, the protists that live in them. That's cool. Yeah, bioluminescence is pretty wild. ran downstairs to grab some coffee. And, uh, we've committed the cardinal sin of being out of coffee. <laughs> oh, no. So um, I'll go check back a little later. Just in the pot, not the beans, right? Uh, not the beans. Otherwise, okay. I think uh, half of us would riot. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking to a group of students yesterday from our studio and taking questions. And one of them asked if we ever make someone walk the plank. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not until we run out of coffee. Pretty much. <laughs> so Val, we had a little bit of fun uh, as you cut open some of your rock samples earlier today. Anything you want to share from uh, what was collected from yesterday? Sure. Yeah, so um, we had a a little bit of a challenging time yesterday uh, locating uh, uh, some samples that we could uh, pick up with the ROV, but we were successful and uh, recovered, um, how many? I forget, five or six? Mm. Enough to keep us happy. Yeah, definitely um, at least six. Yeah, so we did, um, closer to the beginning of the dive, uh, pick up a couple of uh, rocks very close to each other that um, Dr. Orcutt and I were working on for uh, some different things. And uh, this morning, I went and cut them open with the rock saw that we have on board and um, was very pleasantly uh, surprised to find that um, these rocks are a different composition than uh, what we normally pick up. So a pretty common uh, type of lava that we see uh, when we do these uh, these kinds of dives or uh, dredging operations on uh, underwater volcanoes, we see a lot of basalt, which uh, somewhere roughly around uh, uh, half silicon dioxide by weight, and then it has a lot of uh, magnesium and uh, iron in it. And um, yeah, it's a very common, common oceanic rock type. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the hard rock on the ocean floor is also basalt too, that then gets uh, covered in sediments and whatnot. So um, 
what we saw on those first two samples when I cut them open is evidence that um, this, uh, these melts may have started off as basalt, but they sat in uh, the uh, magmatic system of the volcano that we dove on yesterday for quite a long time, which gave them time to cool and start crystallizing. And as you start crystallizing some things, some of those uh, uh, or, you know, even a little bit of assimilation of the, uh, the crust that it was sitting in uh, that can uh, uh, sometimes remove all those crystals and whatnot. That assimilation process can alter the, uh, the composition of the lava and make it uh, so that it has a much higher silica content than uh, basalts. Um, it loses a uh, little bits of that uh, uh, magnesium and uh, iron starts to look a little different as well doesn't necessarily get lost, but that kind of depends on where you are uh, in this differentiation uh, process. But we also saw quite a bit of crystal growth in those melts. Um, so uh, that will be interesting for our uh, geochronologists to look at because uh, some, some of those um, crystal phases may have trapped uh, some of the uh, argon gas that he uses to um, uh, help determine the uh, ages of these lavas and uh, basically pinned down when these uh, seamounts were formed. So um, kind of in the middle of the ridge, um, I haven't had a good chance to look at all of uh, those rocks yet, but they look a little bit more like our typical basalts that we that we see a lot of. And then when we got to uh, waypoint eight uh, yesterday evening, um, that was the high point on the ridge uh, along our original uh, planned dive track. And uh, near waypoint eight, uh, we encountered uh, some really interesting structures that were made out of a material called hyaloclastite. And what that is, is some sort of a, uh, it's a volcano sedimentary rock where you have uh, pretty energetic uh, eruptions occurring that kind of uh, break these lavas into fragments and just, uh, then they, they fall down and, you know, uh, sort of sediment. So it's, it's uh, both uh, volcanic lava and uh, sedimentary, and you can see some uh, sedimentary structures, I think, in uh, some of the imagery that we collected as well. And um, tentatively, it looks like we may have gone up a uh, volcanic rift toward some sort of a uh, volcanic center, this is what I'm thinking initially, um, where uh, Waypoint 8 may have been uh, sort of the main volcanic vent or center, and uh, toward the beginning of the dive, we may have been uh, at the other end of a volcanic rift connected to that system. And uh, there just may have been some uh, magma that was hanging out in uh, the very far end of that rift for uh, quite a long time before it erupted out, which caused it to change that composition. So it'll be in really interesting to look at some of these lavas uh, in more detail down the road and see if that's the kind of, uh, if that's the correct way to interpret uh, what we saw here or not. So what I'm doing at the moment is uh, just tentative field identifications and kind of looking at relationships of these rocks and just kind of getting a feel for what we're seeing. And then we can follow up uh, later um, with some geochemistry work in our uh, labs back at home and uh, see if that uh, hy hypothetical um, scenario still holds or not. So yeah, it was, uh, it was a challenging day, but it was worth it for the samples that we got. It looks like there was something really interesting happening on that ridge volcanically as well as biologically. So it was a cool dive. I have a question about what the white flakes are that we see on the screen while we're diving. Deep sea dandruff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Both living and sloughed off things Sebum. and dead things. <laughs> um, call it marine snow. Although not all of it's marine snow. Some of it is just living plankton. Um, but some of it is marine snow, which is sort of like the dead matter from up in the surface layers sinking down and this that matter actually um, not all of it but a lot of it will sort of like cluster together and sink all the way down to the seafloor um, and that can take variable amounts of time but all the sediment that you see on the seafloor uh, and and a lot of the the sort of food that makes it down there it comes all the way from the What's surface
<laughs> Should I tilt my camera up, see what I can see? <laughs> What if it's like a I don't, like random USBL mooring we put down to do calibrations at some point, you know? Yeah. So as some of you are already aware, we uh, got chased north due to bad weather. And so we are actually uh, just outside of the boundaries of Papahanaumokua Camry National Monument. Uh, still on the Lelukalani Seamount, or, or the ridge, a uh, series of seamounts, but now we are kind of past where they bifurcate or kind of split, and we're just above on the um, the seamounts that we actually just mapped this morning. <laughs> yeah, we're up doing some uh, brand new mapping and science on the fly. So sometimes this happens because, you know, nobody can control the weather. So, uh, you know, if the, if with how uh, socked in uh, uh, our, our southern dive targets are because of the weather, um, we have to be ready to uh, improvise and still make the most we can out of our time at sea. So luckily there's a lot to look at on this ridge. Yeah, I wonder how it's going to compare to yesterday. That was almost overwhelming with how much life there was. Yeah, at one point I was almost convinced that there was more sponge than volcano. <laughs> it was impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know what to expect from this one uh, because we extended the dive uh, slightly last night and uh, transited uh, off, the, off of the ridge that we uh, had been following most of the day and uh, moved over toward um, another feature uh, immediately west of that ridge and everything changed like uh, uh, ocean currents on the bottom changed uh, some of the uh, manganese crust texture it looks like we got um, one piece late in the dive that we thought might have had some uh, volcanic rock attached to it and it turned out I cut that open this morning and discovered that it was um, basically 95 99 percent uh, manganese crust and some of the thickest that we've seen so far on our dives. So um, probably was related to um, the other feature that we were transiting toward before we ended the dive last night. Um, so yeah, it's it's interesting how um, how small that length scale is, relatively speaking, uh, for some of these conditions to change. So I. As much as I would love to try, I don't think it's possible to uh, predict what we're going to find today. So that's kind of fun. It's a lot of fun. And we should be deeper, so outside the oxygen min minimum zone. So we'll see how that impacts things too. Definitely. We have a lot of condition changes as we dive. We're down about 550 meters in depth now. Uh, the water temperature has dropped from 15.7 degrees down to 8.2 and it's dropping we should get down this uh, degrees Celsius I should say and we should get down to just a few degrees Celsius once we're at the bottom it's expected oxygen concentration has dropped off pretty dramatically yeah so one thing that I don't really understand is um why we were seeing such abundant life near the oxygen minimum like do we do we have any ideas on that or is that kind of a mystery at this point i don't know a lot about oxygen minimum zones and and okay. the, the like large megafauna that live there we may have to uh consult with some of our onshore team to help us uh get to the bottom of that I a question about the marine snow. How long does it take that snow to settle on the bottom? Depends on uh, on how wide it is, like the diameter um, and density. And but the so it really helps when there are sort of copepods 
or or smaller um, organisms that will like eat some of the phytoplankton or whatever is in the surface waters. And then it's actually their fecal pellets, their waste pellets, um, will be larger and denser. And that helps things sink faster. So on that time scale, man, my biogeochemistry teacher would be really mad at me for not just being able to know this off the top of my head. But um, it can take anywhere. It's like food pulses in shallower waters can be within the span of like days if you do like a couple hundred meters. Um, for longer than that, it can take weeks, I'd say on the scale of weeks, but it also depends on the currents and, and how they're moving things. Um, yeah, so it's really variable in, in different places, but it can go a lot faster than you'd think. And there's a lot more connectivity between the surface waters and the deep waters than you'd think probably too. Um, for example, like we find, the big science we find microplastics in deep sea sediments. So things that you think might not ever make it to the deep sea definitely do over pretty short time scales. Um, but there are, you know, folks who study sinking rates of, of uh, brain snow and organic matter like that um, as part of their research and they'll set out things like uh, sediment traps um, that will, they'll leave out for a couple weeks and, uh, and, you know, put out with a ship, leave out for a couple weeks, come back and see how much has been trapped in that sediment trap and that helps them quantify how fast the marine snow sinks down which can be important to know nutrient, to, to quantify nutrient cycling. Or, yeah, nutrient cycling, carbon cycling. When I was on an Endeavor cruise um, with the Van Moy lab at Hui, mm -hmm. they were uh, studying, they were doing research at the intersection of phytoplankton, particles, lipids, and exports. So basically marine snow, fish poop. Um, and they had this really cool machine. They had a bunch of students from Stanford doing, it looked like a um, like a very small plexiglass sort of Ferris wheel on a gimbal. And they would put the seawater samples in it. And they had a camera lined up along like the axis of the the Ferris wheel through the glass and you could basically like like in a sort of like video game way select a piece of marine snow to follow and the Ferris wheel would kind of like shift back and forth and the gimbal would shift back and forth so they could mimic it constantly falling through the water column mm. and do studies about like the size of it the weight of it things like that it's a very interesting um tool they brought on board yeah. Yeah. I, I can't quick, even. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I have a question coming in for the front row. Um, is the viewer wondering why it takes so long to descend with our ROVs? Kylie, are we there? That are we there yet? <laughs> I know. I can only go so fast on the winch. We're limited by the speed of the winch. I, I, on this winch, our maximum speed for descent is 30 meters a minute. And um, that's what we got. <laughs> that's what we're dealing with. <laughs> every car has a top speed, and so does every winch and every submarine. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I'm the slow poke in this race. But on the way up, um, Hercules is the limiting factor for how fast we can ascend. So, you know, who doesn't like blue water? Who doesn't like mid water? Come on. So interesting. <laughs> Rhett, could you put the the picture of the winch up, the camera view of the winch? <laughs> so sure everybody thing. can see what we're talking about? Yeah, I'll, I'll throw that minds up. Must see. <laughs> yeah, why not show them what we're working with here? Show them the gear. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good bad Larry. And that. we're right now we're going a little bit slower towards the edges. Mm -hmm. Um just so that we make sure things unspool properly and then we speed up in the middle. Yeah. So it's a delicate dance. Yep. It's below deck. It's a traction winch and it's got about 7,000 meters of cable on it. Yep, and it's very expensive to replace, so we handle it very, very carefully. Yes. <laughs> you talk about what that cable's made out of? 
Uh, six eight, it's, a, it's a 6.8 cable, so it's a steel cable. Um, but if we were to take a cross section of it, it's like some crazy routing of like these like steel fibers going around. Um, and we also have our conductors in there and we have our fiber, like our fiber optics going through there too. So there's a lot of like packaging going on within that actual steel cable. But I think there's like probably like four or five layers of like steel wraps. Um, this like tensile steel going on. So it's a, it's a well-engineered component, um, even though it just looks like a cable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is rated to handle um, quite a bit of weight, but it does have its limits. So what's, what's our normal operating limit for cable tension? Oh, we have, we have actually a nice graph up here. Uh, so our warnings to the back row is 15,000 pounds. And then the kind of, we're gonna come up is 16,500. And then the potential damage to the cable occurs at 20,000 pounds. Um, but we have a nice graph down here and you can kind of see it in the front row. Um, we're well below that right now. Excellent. We have some winch fans in the chat here. Oh, cool. <laughs> My people. Shout out to mm -hmm. the tech people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like winches too. Yeah. <laughs> They're pretty useful. I agree. I am a fan as well. They are just, you know, no matter what oceanographic instrument you're putting in the water, whether it's the ROV or like just a tow sled or um, even sediment traps, you know, they all require a winch. And yeah. um, I had this like little idea to like make um, like a toy for, uh, I'm gonna speed back up, make a toy for kids to like play with in their sinks out of like, um, like sewing bobbins to kind of like, I don't know, help them associate like, just what, is, what does a winch look like? What does it do? And um, like, get hands on with it, you know, before it's like, before they get with the, the big, big, big toys. <laughs> That's a cool idea. Yeah. You're giving away your million dollar idea though. Yeah, Kyla, well, you gotta be careful with these things. Hello, <laughs> internet. That's my IP. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> and a few questions about ballast with our ROVs. Um, one is uh, about the plates that we use, how heavy they are. And the second one is whether we use seawater uh, to change our ballast at all. Yeah, so the plates we use are 16 pounds uh, or so in water. Uh, and we do not use seawater for changing our ballast. That is uh, not our MO, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I don't know. Maybe it's harder to maintain. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't maintained those, those types of systems before. Maybe Kylie can speak to that a bit. Yeah, Alvin. Alvin uses a combination of uh, the same plates we use, but in uh, larger quantities. And they use uh, like water ballast. They have main ballast tanks that they can fill and empty um, in order to have more buoyancy. They can jettison their, they have like, so we have three individual plates, we call them Alvin plates, um, up on the forward sled of uh, uh, the porch of uh, Hercules, and Alvin uses like 17 to 20 in a stack, and they have like six stacks, and they can bounce them off and um, come to the surface very fast. I was gonna try to show the plates here for your com for your discussion. Yes, <laughs> they're they're it. under the grate. They're the brown under the grate on the starboard side under the scoop. And then the left side, you can only see the, the twine that we would reach to grab with the manipulator. And the nice thing is that it's all biodegradable over time, so it does eventually disappear. Yeah, fish food. <laughs> Question about whether any of us have been in a HOV like Alvin and what we did if we if we have done that. I was their intern for a while. 
but I didn't get a dive. I just worked on deck. Those seats are like really, so they, so the Alvin fits three people in it, a pilot and two scientists, unless it's an engineering dive, they'll you know, take the science seats for engineers um, and technicians. Um, but there are, so Alvin is like uh, launched and recovered from the platform, the Atlantis. And there are people that have worked on the Atlantis for years and years and years in support of Alvin. Um, like the crew and the stewards. And um, when I was on board, um, we had a couple available slots for non-scientists to get a dive, and they went to those longtime crew members, which I thought was appropriate. There's a great uh, mock-up replica of the cockpit of Alvin at the uh, Visitor Center at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. It's a cozy space. Do they let you squeeze in there? It, it, they, it's sort of uh, just sort of the front end. It's not the whole yeah. HOV, but kind of reminds me of the deck of the Millennium Falcon, like when you see <laughs> the Honey Chewie sitting there. Does it have a bad motivator? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. And then it, it's all set to go to hyperspace. <laughs> uh, there's a question about what the difference is when we're talking about the front row and the back row. Uh, in the control van here, our front row is uh, reserved for the, the pilots of Argus and, well, we're not Argus, Atalanta today, and Hercules, and our navigator and video engineer. And the back row is more of a science focus. So we've got our um, data collectors and uh, science communicators, and our lead scientist, Val, is with us today. Hello. When we do get to the bottom, uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time looking for rocks, I think, today. We may see a whole lot of biology. Uh, don't be surprised if we pass by some of it. Uh, we had a, a great biology day yesterday. Our uh, seamount was slathered with sponges and corals and uh, stars and all kinds of things. Um, it was so full that there were it was hard to find a rock that didn't have something on it for quite a while. Since both of our lead scientists on board are uh, focused on rock samples, that will be one of our primary objectives, is to collect those. Yep, and uh, we have some uh, onshore scientists who are helping us out uh, with a lot of the biology too, and they are absolutely invaluable. And uh, they, have, uh, they have a request list that we uh, keep an eye on just in case we come across uh, some biological uh, specimens that, um, are, that are scientifically really valuable. So we, we actually found a few of those uh, yesterday, which was pretty exciting. Our ROVs have a number of ways to collect data and samples primary one you're probably using right now if you're watching our feed and that's a camera we have several cameras um, we have some high definition cameras and we have uh, cameras that are sort of pointed at different parts of the ROV so that our pilots can see what's going on uh, not just in the front but on the sides as well we've also got uh, a slurp sampler which is my favorite it's basically like an underwater vacuum that empties into a rotating cartridge of uh, sample containers so we can suck up things that probably wouldn't do so well um, if we were trying to grab them. We've got a manipulator arm which is uh, one of the ways that we're going to use to pick up rocks. Yeah. And, but it also uh, is able to take biological samples. It has like a cutter on one part of it. So you think it was just like what we just saw on the front? Yeah. 
We have two manipulators. We have two, that is correct. And three if you count me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Two manipulators. Hercules has two manipulators. Professional, professional, sorry. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> We also have a, a scoop that we can use with a manipulator arm to scoop up uh, loose objects or other objects that it would be harder to grab onto. And we've got some uh, push core samplers that the arms can use to shove down into the ground and take a sample of the sediment that's down there and see all the layers. There's our scoop and our slurp. We've also got a knife there. Um, in case we ever need to cut anything free. Hey, is the Telestrator going out on satellite? I don't know. Let's try. How's it? Yeah, how's it look? Whoop. No, but I <laughs> put it there. So this, this is our scoop and our slurp Wait, here. Wait, it's, it's not going out quite oh, yet. Oh, it's not yet? Not okay. Yet. <laughs> Whoops. That's just for us. <laughs> <laughs> Do something they can't see yet. <laughs> mm, that's about when it would go online, so that I Raj, don't want mind. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing my luck. Disregard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we used to have a long pointer stick, so when we wanted to ask the pilots to go somewhere in particular, we'd either have to describe it or, or point to use it. Use the pointy stick. Yeah. So yep. We would do that on Falcor, too. Now we can write right on the screen. Yeah, this is, uh, it's, it's really cool having a telestrator. I've never used one of those before, so it's like. New tech is always fun, too. Yeah. All right, the Telestrator should be up on sat feed one now. OK. Yep. Is that showing up? Yeah. See yeah. There. There we go. So what I just circled there, this is our uh, scoop. And then you can see the nozzle for the slurp uh, sitting right beneath it. And our knife on the left-hand bottom corner. Uh, this one. Well, that's one of, I think, several that have been hidden. <laughs> we and like knives. <laughs> I, I will refrain from making questionable jokes. <laughs> Just up to the left out of camera view are the um, draw the poles to, to launch the Niskin water collection. Yeah. It's another sampling tool we have, those there. little colorful loops. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Our, our, our camera has a mind of its own at the moment sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes it likes to go further than we want it to go. <laughs> so yeah, these are uh, the Niskin uh, pull triggers. So uh, when we want to collect a water sample, um, uh, the pilots will move one of the manipulator arms over and uh, uh, hook into one of those loops and give it a good tug. And that fires the Niskin and it will fill with uh, uh, seawater. Um, Right, can you put the can you put the Niskin cam on Sat three so they can see what the Niskins look like? Sure. It's port, port rail. Gotcha. Leela, just FYI, we did some maintenance on the bottles and double checked the vents and everything. Thank you. You got it. So the Niskin cam should be up on SAT 3 now. So we have six Niskin bottles. They're currently all open. And um, when you pull on the monofilament up forward, it will, uh, l I don't know, let go of uh, how they're, how do I say that? It'll trigger. Trigger, that's the word. It'll trigger them to close. They're basically just tubes with a rubber stopper at each end that when you pull the trigger, they'll snap into place and lock up any water that's in there along with any organic matter. Um, we have a few things we're going to be using our Niskin bottles for. Our microbiologist, lead scientist, uh, Beth Orcutt, is going to be using some of that water to uh, get information about the microbiota that are around the places that we take rock samples. And we can also send some off for eDNA analysis to find out uh. what organisms' cells might have ended up in the water around where we're exploring. Okay. 
So if folks are interested in learning about some of the species that we're going to be seeing on this dive or seen in the past, there actually are two guides out right now. Um, if you type in NOAA benthic animal ID, that should bring up the, um, the ID guide that's been put together through NOAA. And that's pretty big, <laughs> so you have plenty to look through. And there's codes for where um, eat the different species work, images were captured. Uh, and then also a code for the depth at which they were, the video was captured or the image was captured. And then at um, the dark lab at the University of Hawaii actually just released an online ID guide that is focused on species in Papanao Mokua Camry National Monument. And I think the easiest way to find that would be to type in S-O-E-S-T-D-A-R-K, I'm sorry, D-O-D-A-R-C, and then uh, Benthic ID. I think we'll bring it up for you. Well, those are some of the tools that all of us are referring to just to keep track of the different species or uh, organisms that have been um, seen and identified or we still have questions with too. So we're hoping for about a 12 hour dive today. And we had a question about, um, have there ever been non-weather situations that ended up uh, needing to abort a dive? Yes. <laughs> we had one on this cruise already. Every once in a while, some seawater and electric circuits get in contact with each other when they shouldn't. Or so sometimes it's ship related. Yeah. That was another one. Yeah. Our ship couldn't hold its position. Or sometimes it's, yeah, personnel related. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's every factor. <laughs> like there's, yeah, there's <laughs> all, the, all the things, yes. It's all, yeah. Yes, sometimes it's just better to recover. Sometimes it's the best course forward. This question about is there any place online we could see a picture of that cable in cross section? I just Googled it actually. Six point six eight oceanographic cable and then there's like a unals.org um, handbook of oceanographic winch wire and cable. Um, and so like the 0.68, like it's called that because it's a, um, like it's 0.68, the diameter of an inch, you know, like 0.68 of, of an inch um, in diameter. And uh, it's very commonly used. Uh, a few different ships use it. Um, so I would imagine that would be a good resource for that. Yeah. Even if you look at like images and stuff, basically. You want to look at oceanographic cable and things like that. Ours just happens to have um, conductors and a uh, stainless steel K-tube for the fibers to be protected in. Red, are you able to call up a map that might show where we are now in comparison to where we were last night? Uh, I'm not sure. Does anyone else know what that would be called? What was that? I'm not sure. Uh, We're giving you all the challenge questions. Was it right? I think. Point I didn't know there was going to be a test. Yeah. <laughs> if you put up, um, can you put up like ship house things or no? Probably not. Um, not to my knowledge. I can look around and see what I get. Yeah, because ship house has a graph of where we've been. Looks like Suleiman's doing some stuff on the high pack computer. Oh, there you go. Oh, cool. I'll go to that. I so I, th I th yeah, I think we were here somewhere. I think I'm clear. I'm going to speed back up. Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, you look clear. Raj. We were just southeast of where we are now. Yeah, over here. OK, so now on sat feed three, we have uh, the high pack up, which uh, Suleiman has zoomed quite far out on, um, showing, and I'll let uh, other people explain exactly what it's showing. I think, so I think it was somewhere here, or 
it's hard to tell the scale here. Yeah, yeah I don't know how. What did Dwight say? But it's not far, though. Yeah, it was not far. Oh, actually, wait. Zoom out more, Suleiman. There, there it is. Is that where we were? This. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. There we go. You're right. Yeah. Hard to tell the scale. <laughs> And if we go all the way out, you can see that that's near that bifurcation of the, the bifurcation being where the, the Liliuokalani Ridge seems to split in two. Yeah. So we're here and then here. Mm -hmm. But the uh, King George's Seamount was way towards the. Um, that's a way southeast. Way south, yeah. yeah. Just just to get an idea of the scale, do we know how many like miles that is about that we've traveled? Since yesterday? Yeah. Silmon's on it. So we have we have been mapping actually, but the distance fit between from where we where we are now and yesterday it's about fifteen or twelve mile. Okay. So we moved uh, northwest, fifteen or twelve mile almost. And, and where Thanks. we are today is what we just mapped uh, overnight after finishing yesterday's dive. So That's correct. It's very much new data collection on the fly. How many of you are asking uh, what the role of Argus or Atalanta is, whether it collects data or it's just for a third-person view? Oh, it's, it's uh, very useful for operations. Um, we have a sonar on Argus, which can see out to the whatever features we're working on. Um, so that's very useful for us for kind of positional awareness and um, environmental surroundings awareness, in addition to having a nice camera on it for this awesome bird in the sky view and um, we also, on Argus, not on Atalanta, but we have like a sub-bottom profiler. Um, so we get also a lot of information back from that as well. Um, a lot of it's for operational purposes, but yeah, it does help that there's a nice uh, HD camera on it as well. And kind of the most important role um, is that it's also separating a lot of the ship movements from, uh, from HERC. And so that helps to make smoother flying. Laterals in, in, in one vehicle. So another question for science. Uh, a couple questions actually asking about when we collect samples of coral or fish, things like that, uh, do they survive bringing them up to the surface? Mm. Sometimes, yeah. So a lot of people will ask about like if they, because of the pressure change, explode. Um, that doesn't really happen because even the fish that live down there and also the invertebrates that live down there, they don't really have any gas-filled chambers. So they're, they're, if they do have some kind of an internal chamber, like some of the fish will have like oil-filled swim bladder type things. So um, it doesn't expand, like air would expand a lot. Um, or, yeah, ex as pressure decreases, volume increases, yeah. Air would expand a lot upon ascent, but they don't have those air filled chambers. So um, really one of the, the battles is the temperature, but our bio boxes seal pretty well. So they're generally in water, the temperature of where they came from. And we'll put them straight in, straight in the fridge. So when we're first documenting and cataloging, cataloging samples, especially the invertebrates will sometimes still be um, living, which is pretty cool. Mm, yeah. We've got folks in five continents joining us. So welcome, everyone. Can you list off some of the countries? I'm curious. Uh, I'm trying that again. got folks from the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, Norway, Hong Kong,
Guernsey, Germany, Brazil. Cool. Shalom. Does the viewership change with time of day? Like, do you notice that if it's daytime in a certain part of the world, there's more people watching from there? Mm. I haven't really thought about that. I think our heaviest viewership tends to be from the US, regardless of uh, what time it is. But I'm sure there's probably some correlation between uh, daylight hours and uh, whether people are going to be tuned in or not. Sure. Looks like we are about 1,350 meters now almost. So this is about the depth of yesterday's dive. Still have a little ways to go for this one. So let's see, we're expecting to start close to uh, 2,200 meters down today, quite a bit deeper. Okay, so I went on a deep dive into this sponges and low oxygen situation. Um, a different kind of deep dive. No a different kind of deep dive <laughs> as we're passing through the oxygen minimum. So, um, it seems like sponges especially can be really tolerant of low oxygen um, and some of them will do that with the help of microbial symbi symbionts that can do anaerobic respiration. Um, so that's pretty cool. But they can, there are all kinds of things that they can change. Um, and even like one species of sponge will change different things about it itself to adapt to lower oxygen, um, even temporarily sometimes. And so they can change like the the rate at which they're metabolizing um, food or they can change the rate at which they're pumping water through their bodies. Um, and so they'll slow that down if the oxygen is particularly low. They um, can change their shape. So there's some morphologies um, that take up or, or that, yeah, that, that exchange gas and take up oxygen better. So they'll, they'll change their morphology or grow differently. Um, yeah, so they have lots of different strategies for uh, coping with lower oxygen, um, mm. but it seems like sponges in particular are are capable of that. Is this something that we might be able to see in some of the eDNA analyses or like some sort of genomic uh, genomics? Mm, you mean like uh, to see if that that species had been oxygen stressed? Yeah, uh, I don't or know that, that organism. Would, yeah, I don't know if that would uh, mm -hmm. select for some uh, yeah. different genes or like some epigenetic factors that we might be able to look at. Yeah, maybe there'd be ep epigenetic factors. So epigenetics, that's kind of like um, ways that a, an organism will alter its DNA while it's alive. So like not like genetic, not like evolution from one generation to the next, but they can change like methylation, for example. They can change different th things about their DNA. Um, but I imagine that with transcriptomics, if you were to really, I mean, that depends on what, how, so transcriptomics is instead of doing like a, a study on the DNA of an orga organism, you do a study on the RNA. Um, and that's basically what gets translated from DNA into like the instruction manual for proteins. Um, it's sort of an intermediate step. Um, and and what that does, because organisms will have lots and lots of genes that they're not necessarily using all the time, but if you look at just what they've transcribed into instructions to make proteins, then you know which ones they've been using. So sometimes you can look at um, whether an organism is stressed by seeing what genes it's using, what genes it has turned on doing transcriptomics. Um, but that RNA is really, even we were talking the other day about the stability of DNA, mm -hmm. which can, you know, it lasts a bit longer, but RNA is really um, unstable. Uh, so it might not be the easiest to pick up any DNA um, samples because it doesn't stick around for very long, but you know, there's a possibility that you could use that kind of thing also to see if there are markers 
or indications that there are oxygen stressed organisms around. Wow. <laughs> that's very cool. I don't know if that's been done with like like e RNA. I don't know if that's a thing, but you do that on st on studies like with organisms that you have in the lab, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just have. This is my first time uh, uh, working on a cruise where we've taken e DNA samples. So this is a completely new concept to me. So it'll be interesting to see what we learn from it. Mm -hmm. We did have. Um, on a cruise last year in Santa Barbara Basin, um, a group from Hui, uh, Joan Berenfeld's lab, they were looking at foraminifera in uh, deep sea sediments in super low oxygen. Um, and they were doing some really cool uh, RNA-based studies. So we had to be super fast with the, they were the, taking sediment cores. And we had to get those into us we like had the whole wet lab super cold and we had to get those off the rov super quickly and into the wet lab to try and preserve that rna and and wow. sediment samples you can sort of think of as edna too because you're just getting everything that you can that's in a sample it might not be water but it's kind of like a sediment edna right yeah because there's often some sort of bacterial uh, colony or colonies mm -hmm. in, in the sediments that we sample uh, down at these depths. Right. There's all kinds of fungi and bacteria and archaea and you're not really, since they're so small, you're not selecting like, I want to pick up this one. You're taking anything that's in that sediment. And so when you sequence that, sequence the um, DNA in that, you're, you're going to get back, depending on how you do that, you're going to get back like anything that's in that sample. Had a viewer comment uh, on uh, Justin mentioned the the guides that you can download. There are also deep sea guides available from Ocean Networks Canada and the Monterey Bay Aquarium. If you're interested in those, I have one person wondering how Hercules is powered from the ship. Through the ship, through the cable, through the conductors. But Jessica can explain more. Oh, that's pretty much it. That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we give it power through the ship. Yeah, <laughs> sometimes folks ask if we use batteries or whatnot, but not us. Um, we don't use batteries. We use power from the ship coming down. Um, yeah, mm, yeah. I, I know a lot of like really small ROVs, like the micro ROVs, like Blue Robotics, the Blue ROV2 or something like this, they use batteries, I think, and only have comms through a cable. But um, when you have a big, beefy machine like ours, you want uh, you want full jam. <laughs> As we have all these colloquial sayings for just saying that we need more, more power. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's a really interesting question. Has there been any ocean misconceptions that are so wrong but still being mistaken and spread? Like things that you might have read about on the internet. The deep sea is boring and there's nothing down there. <laughs> that is definitely one of them. That sharks are uh, scary and bad. <laughs> That's yeah. also another yeah. misconception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My favorite is that if you get stung by a jellyfish, you can pee on it. I mean, you can you can pee on it, but <laughs> you can do it no one's gonna <laughs> stop you. But you need to put acid on it uh, with like vinegar or lemon juice or something. That actually works. But uh, urine is not an acid; it's uh. a slight mild base. So people have been peeing on their jellyfish stings for no reason for <laughs> decades. Mm. <laughs> it just felt right. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> I did not know that, so that is yeah. <laughs> <Good job>. <laughs> vital. <laughs> Tess is over here, like, I've done that multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't somebody saying that vinegar also works well for uh, sea, ur sea urchin uh, spines, if you get mm. uh, if you get poked by one of those? Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't either. I've had so many of them. Oh, I guess they're calcium-based, right? So I have no idea. All that I know is that they hurt a lot. They sure do. One thing I haven't tried yet that I've heard is if you 
put your wherever you get stung in as hot a water as you can stand. It breaks down the, the protein structure of the venom. But I heard that either. Don't mm -hmm. take my word for it. Somebody was just telling me that one. Well, we're definitely going to take your word for it, but you'll get a phone call from me if I'm <laughs> like, I stuck burned. my hand in boiling water. <laughs> now Don't I got do that. Third degree burn. Yeah, as, as, as hot as you could stand. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd rather pee on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's uh, another misconception, not to get away from the toilet <laughs> commentary, but that, <laughs> that your toilet spins in a certain direction oh, yeah. based on the Coriolis effect. That is actually not accurate. Yeah. Um, it's not big enough of a yeah, bowl that yeah. that takes effect. Coriolis effect is responsible for the gyres that are found in the world's oceans, but you need to be ocean-sized for that. Unless you have a really big toilet, I don't think that would work. <laughs> you know, a question about uh, why the oxygen level is at a minimum around 1,250 meters and now rising. Mm. Um, the deep sea starts to get. Uh, well, let's see if I get if I get this right. It starts to get ventilated. Like there are currents that are coming through in the deeper ocean that have more oxygen in them than like the upper layers where everything has been. Like so, all that this marine snow that's sinking there are things that are uh, consuming it and in metabolizing that they are using oxygen the same way that we use oxygen um, to help us metabolize the food that we eat. Organisms that are in the sort of the surface layers are also eating up all this marine snow and using up all the oxygen to do that. And so as you get lower and lower and lower where more and more food has sunk through that water, um, you'll see the oxygen all get used up, but then uh, other waters are coming into the deeper layers um, and bringing new oxygen, deep currents. Although those also are lower oxygen than in the surface. So at this point in our dive, we are, how deep are we? Uh, 15, uh, about 1,600 meters. Our yeah. oxygen levels, our uh, O2 concentration levels are rising pretty significantly, and we're down to just over 2 degrees Celsius with our temperature. It's a brisk day, isn't it? Mm. 2 degrees. <laughs> so one of the reasons that we have cold water, even closer to the equator uh, when you get to the bottom is that cold water is more dense and will sink relative to warmer water. So the coldest water will settle down at the bottom. It doesn't go down to zero at the bottom because we all know that at zero degrees Celsius, uh, fresh water at least, will, will freeze solid. And um, forming those crystals actually makes it a little less dense and it floats back up to the top. That's why your ice, ice cubes float in your glass of water. There are also some factors with uh, salinity as well that cause water to sink. We have about 500 meters to go. Raj, 500. 500. I thought you were going to start singing songs from Rant. 500. No, it's just a uh, random, random, random phrases, words. Uh, you had my vote. <laughs> for, <it>. for American <laughs> Idol? Not a, not a list idol? <laughs> not a, not a list idol. Nautilus musical theater. Yeah. Nautilus idol. 
Oh yeah, that reminds me, people were asking what um, people who follow Nautilus should be called. There were a couple ideas like Nautilookies or something like that. No. The oh. <laughs> no. 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 This is no. all no. No. That was veto. That was mine. That was mine. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. The Argonauts, the... Oh, there's another yeah, one. I don't think we have ever, really good ones. Never landed on one that stuck. <laughs> Oh, the sea fans. Sea fans. Oh, that that's good. I like that one. I like that one. That one's good. Can I be a part of the sea fan club, actually? Oh, definitely. Of course. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Who's the number one bag fan, of chocolate I think. is this? I need to. I'm going to keep it. Do we need to move it back? It needs to be removed. Okay. <laughs> um, we have a question about uh, Beth Orcutt's research. Uh, why is she interested in uh, the microbiology of the ferromanganese crust rocks? Should I answer that one again? You want to answer it, Val? Um, you might have the better okay. worded response. Okay, this was, okay, why why the microbes on the, the yeah. crust? Yeah. Um, I should really make sure with Beth that I'm getting this spiel right, but um, one of the things that Beth is interested in quantifying is the, the role, so, and she's interested in like the inherently, what's the role of those microbes uh, in these crust, uh, sort of habitats, ecosystems, um, are they playing a role in, in like facilitating the formation of those crusts? Um, and then also sort of from like an economic perspective in areas beyond the monument, not in, in Papahanaumokuake Marine National Monument, but in areas where there are deep sea mining leases for those ferromanganese crust areas. Um, are there benefits that we're losing that the microbial community provides um, in in mining those crusts? Um, so, sort of describing the roles that they're playing and quantifying what those services are worth um, in in money numbers, so we know what we're losing um, is part of what Beth is interested in there, I believe. And they're also, since this is, you know, the deep sea is a really interesting environment where uh, microbes have adapted lots of different strategies to live in various biogeochemical conditions. They produce lots of really interesting compounds to do that. And some of those secondary compounds that they produce are secondary metabolites, they're called organic compounds. They um, can be biopharmaceutically and biotechnologically valuable um, and that does that's not to say that you know then we'll start collecting all the microbes um, and using them for those purposes but if you can find out what a compound does um, a compound that that nature has created that these microbes have created and uh, and there's a biopharmaceutical or biotechnological use for them then you could synthetically uh, recreate that kind of a compound um, yeah or you know grow microbes in a laboratory that um, can produce that compound. Are there any classrooms watching today? Um, they can write in and tell us to give them a shout out. Yeah, if there are any classrooms watching us, I know there's at least one teacher. I know that Megan said that a lot of people tune in th through the <laughs> YouTube live stream yeah, now. Yeah, that is true. Oh, so right. it's hard to tell how many people are on or watching. Right. Oh, we have another suggestion for uh, the name of our fans, uh, the Illuminati. <laughs> 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 I made him say that one because it was just too funny. <laughs> the sea, there's another person who said the Sea Stalkers. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> okay. I think C fans is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, this this seems happier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we are getting not too far from the the bottom. We're about two hundred and fifty meters off of our goal. We plan to travel um up the uh, unnamed western seamount rising about 200 meters before we ascend back to the ship. And we should cover a distance of approximately 2.2 .2 kilometers if all goes as planned.
one of our uh, scientists ashore. Uh, Steve is telling us that 128 people are currently watching this dive on YouTube. Mm. Cool. I forget, are you, are you able to comment via YouTube or only through the website? Only the website? Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody wants to continue to ask questions, just go ahead and go to nautiluslive.org and you'll see a little start chat box. Yeah. Slowing. If yeah. you're watching live. If you're not watching live, we won't be able to see your questions. Right. Yep. And I apologize, I haven't answered every question, but uh, trying to get as many as them, of them as the conversation allows. Um, I know a lot of folks on YouTube, one of the nice things is you can rewind it and kind of watch what, what you missed and skim through. But we don't have the comments open on YouTube because that would require a moderator and we have a lot of jobs already in the ship. I don't think we <laughs> there have are only a so many of moderator us. position. Yep. Plus we can't live stream YouTube. That would be not cool for our bandwidth. Oh, yeah. That, oh yeah. That is also true. <sighs> Can you imagine like we're <laughs> never mind. We're like sending out what we're doing and watching what we're doing. So we're like sending it out to a satellite and bring it back to the thing. But we can actually see what we're already doing. Just so we could mod <laughs> moderate the <laughs> conversation. <laughs> I think we'd make the satellite explode. Yeah, <laughs> like no, too many outgoing calls. Can't, can't, can't do. Not happening. That's like when you pull up the scientists ashore portal back here. It also always pulls up the quad, but it's like you know, you're oh. sitting right in front of the quad, but you're <laughs> yeah. looking at the quad like the in here. Quad. That's being like rerouted. <laughs> you gotta like close that, close that down. Stop loading the page. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Another thanks. page, quick. Ah, uh, do you want any twizzlers? I'm good, thank you. All right, thanks. That one was easy. Brett, I think you got to. Oh, it's the smell. It's the good one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't hand it to me. <laughs> Control band treats. Keep us going. Yep. Basically little snacks that um, will not make a mess up here. So we need to keep uh, liquids and other crumbs and other detritus. Uh, <laughs> detritus. Of our, uh, yes. <laughs> Especially uh, that marine Out snow. of our um, keyboards and our consoles. Since I was cutting rocks this you morning, have to, I, this discipline is just really great, Kylie. Give in to the dark side, Kylie. <laughs> <laughs> Eat a Twizzlers. <laughs> you, it's the smell. It's the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> what were you gonna say? Uh, oh. It was the whole detritus thing. Yeah, I was cutting rocks this morning and uh, ended up with my own ferromanganese <laughs> coating. Um, I sure did. So I, yeah, <laughs> Justin was helping me <laughs> with the, the, the uh, rock processing this morning. And I went to go uh, clean up a little bit before coming on shift. And I look in the mirror and I'm just like, like uh, my whole face was just covered in ferromanganese. So yeah, cleaning up was a good idea. That's not the kind of thing that you want to track into the lab, into the van. That's some dedicated science right there. Nobody ever said geology was a clean science. Usually we're at our best when we're covered in a layer of some kind of particulate. <laughs> except, in the, except in isotope clean rooms, that's a bad idea. If you're covered in dust, don't go into the clean lab. A uh, question about what's everybody's favorite ocean dwelling animal? You know, mine is the lump fish or the lump sucker. They are the ugliest football-shaped little bumpy things as adults, but their babies are the most adorable. They look <laughs> like cartoons. They have these little big eyes, and that's that's one to Google. Baby lumpfish. <laughs> It'll make your day. I don't know if it's. I wouldn't call it my favorite, but it's just kind of a wild organism to be there as the cookie cutter shark. I've, you look that up. I've seen a lot of scarring on oh, brave yeah, animals. Oh yeah, that's from right. That. I don't know what my favorite animal is. I've always been kind of fascinated by jellyfish, but mm. I don't know. My favorite animal might honestly be the lavas. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a valid answer. I unless know. you count all the microbes on top of the lavas. <laughs> that might count. You want to slow? Oh, no, sorry. I'll just catch up in a second. 
I'm about to catch up. Oh man, I and wish I had a good answer stop. for that. There's just so much. By now I really should have one. <laughs> There's but not I really don't. one right answer. I can't, I can't yeah. pick any. He's got to pick your favorite for the moment. Uh, uh, I'm like trying to remember if there was some like, oh, the Kyra Stylid squat lobster. That was the first thing that I got to hold when it came up from the deep sea and it was it was a mission trying to get this little 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 thing because Chris so this was on NA 101 in 2018 in Papanaumokuake why can I not say that on comms Papanaumokuake Marine National Monument um, and that was on it was for a lot further east in the monument but uh, they, these squat lobsters, the way they swim, they kind of like, they back it up. They, they like scooch backwards. Oh, yeah, and they so go really they fast and they're really tiny. And Chris really wanted this thing. And we were like yeah. chasing it around with the slurp. It was just so difficult to get, but finally got it. And I thought it was going to be big, you know, but then it came up and it was this teeny little thing. It was so cute. And uh, I think, yeah, that, that one was my favorite because it's all pink and it's super spiny and funky looking. And there's a picture of me holding it in the lab. Very proud. That's cool. Yeah, if our viewers get a chance to uh, look for a video of a squat lobster uh, swimming, they're pretty. They're, they're pretty fun so to watch. They're so silly. Yeah, they 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 go backwards. They go tail first, and they have these big claws that kind of follow. Leela, can you help me remember the name, the real name of the mermaid fingers? Mermaid fingers. Was that a sponge? I don't know. I don't remember mermaid fingers. Well, they came up on um, Argus last year during one of our cruises, and they're not called protozoans, but... Oh, do you mean... Wait. They look... You don't mean the toenails. You don't mean no, the... No, it's like a... It looks like a finger, and it's like jelly-like. It has ridges. Oh, are you uh, talking about pyrosomes? Oh, pyrosomes. pyrosomes? Pyrosomes, yes. The other P word, yes. yes, yes pyrosomes. Yes. I thought those were cool. Those are... Yeah, we're seeing more and more... Ooh, is that the bottom? That's no, the I hope not. <laughs> Hopefully not. I was going to say, we've a ways to go. Oh, wait, yeah, we have a ways to go. Yeah, we just meters, hit 2,000 meters. That was just me tripping out, don't worry. <laughs> um, pyrosomes, there are a lot of those now in the water column on the west coast of the U.S. They kind of do well in lower oxygen. Um, and so they're, they've sort of been Slowly. taking over there. They're like really big zooplankton because they're not really they can't really control their own motion so we call them plankton still because they just float in the water um i think they're tunicates colonial tunicates pyrosomes yeah they're so cool yes they're free-floating tunicate colonies accidental sample oh yeah and warmer temperatures they also do better in, in warmer temperatures with lower oxygen hashtag climate change We had a couple new uh, suggestions for names for our watch. Uh, one was the Sea Peepers. Oh man, these are all just, <laughs> yeah. One is the Nautophiles, oh. like Extremophiles, because we're always here. That's a cool one. Yeah. Benthophile? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I'll stop. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. That's we good like one. the Benthos. A question uh, for anyone: uh, Have you done other field work outside of the Nautilus, and is it the most fun part of the job? Is field work the most fun part of the job? I guess so. Yeah. I mean, field work is the most fun part of the job for sure. Yes, and yes. I also like the chemistry part of it mm -hmm. too. You like dissolving rocks, Val? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Total big, pro. Big fan. I mean, it's kind of, it's super metal. Like, like I'm just going to dissolve rocks with these, like, really harsh chemicals. That's really cool, <laughs> yeah. you know? All right, we it got it one is a lot of fun. It's Doppler. Raj Raj? It's not always the easiest uh, when you're working on uh, samples where you need larger amounts of material than, than uh, is typical. But that's also part of the challenge, too. So we have about... 150 meters at 100 meters we're going to quiet down so front row can focus on coming to the bottom and getting all set up so yep we're just the folks in the back seat here and uh, let the drivers do their job when we get to the 
some good point. Um, I'm going to hit the dive salvo again, and it's going to change everything. But if you can put back those two PCs, that would be lovely. <laughs> Thank you. <all. laughs> I love that. <laughs> Three beams, 100 meters off the deck. Raj, Raj. 115, but running down. So for those of you just joining us, we're about a uh, hundred meters off the bottom or so. We'll be on the seafloor at the uh, un, uh, unnamed seamount west. All right, come all stop. I'll hit the dive salvo. Raj. Cool. Full beams. Um, before uh, we get deep into the checks, is the still cam on already? Yeah, still cam's on. Perfect, thanks. Let me know if you want a power cycle. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Me too. My hands are so cold. Oh, you're you actually, that was like a joke. So okay, Raj. Like chilling? Are you chilling? Oh, no, I, I meant if he was cold. Oh, Raj, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Stop feeding it. <laughs> Sullivan, I don't know why I'm remembering this now, but the dates that I tried, are you listening, Sullivan? Yes. Okay, the dates that I tried, your dates the other day, they're so good. Like that one from your farm tastes like caramel. Yes, it's, yes, the little ones are incredible. Yes. <laughs> I'll drag Rennie over. <laughs> I know you've been trying for a long time. <laughs> I missed out. I had just brushed my teeth and <laughs> declined. Halas are the the one finish. Yeah, because we will finish them all. <laughs> They're so good. I'm all stop. Roger that. I'll stop. Dive salvo. Mm hmm. Wow. Love it. Sorry? No, I did not. Try and centering up here a little bit. All right, roger that. So, Lon, would you mind zooming in here? Uh, thank you. Back row, just to talk about it, once we land over here, would you like to start moving all the way towards the waypoint 2 immediately, or you would like to hang around for some time? Uh, let's hold for a minute uh, at the landing spot and get an idea of what the landscape looks like, because uh, if possible, we want to pick up um, a uh, Dr. Orcutt and a geology sample. Um, so if there's nothing suitable there, then we can start moving on toward waypoint two. Okay, copy that. Thanks. And waypoint two is 
700 meters away just for scale. Yes, it is. Turn auto heading on. Roger that. Is this your zone? Got no juice. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I got in my camera bottom left. Got you that. Tilt down a little. All right. Ready to come down? Ready, ready. Raj. Just forward. Everything else feels like down at least. I don't know if you've lateraled much. Yeah, forward is just the, uh, the horizontal for some reason. Gotcha. It's like I'm like full full head on the horizontals, and barely making way. Yeah. Bottom is in sight. Red, red. Here we are. That's pretty different from yesterday's landing. What are you? Do we have a crinoid? Yeah. Huh. 
Yeah. But the thing right in the middle. Rock? Oh, that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is oh, just yet. I don't yet. know what that is. Getting a Looks look like around. there's some loose things that you could... Oh, look at oh, that. Oh, here we go. Okay. Right. Okay. Oh. okay, I just have to turn around. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody already will do the... Uh, yeah, I'll get settled down here and I'll okay. have a good position for you there, Suleiman. It was just waiting for us. Yeah, it was. Yeah, right I think spot. I see some good sample material. All right, you're all clear. Okay, let's do it. So, we'll, uh, take a couple minutes here to get the ROV situated and everything calibrated, and then we'll get to work, the other work. Okay, shall I do the uh, reset on the... Go ahead. Resetting DVL. Roger that. Okay. They looks good. Awesome, thank you. The names keep coming in. We got the Nostronauts, the Winch Lovers, the Rock Nabbers, the Seeper Peepers. The Nostronauts? Nostronauts. Interesting. That is interesting. I never heard a Nostronaut before. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Are some of those name suggestions for this particular watch? Uh, <laughs> I, I guess so. Or maybe the is people that, the, that are the fans that are, the fans that the are watchers. watchers. Mm. Uh, let's get, it looks like this is the most amount of light out here. Uh, let me make sure I have everything on. May I check the lights? Yeah. Yeah, we have everything except for porch on. Huh. Maybe the iris is a little closed. Yeah. Looks like that's probably the area you want there, right? Go ahead and push on in there. Roger that. And I think, Kylie, that the sonar is correct. Raj. It's like the first time. <laughs> We're just doing a quick calibration on the cameras. So that's why we're zoomed in on uh, the arm. Let's just do some color balancing. Another name, the Nosferatus. It's a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> I'll get it there. Red. Caridia shrimp. Oh wait, you can only see that in still cam. So if folks at home refresh their browsers, you'll now see that the live data feed uh, depicts Atlanta instead of Argus. We're using uh, different ROV. Yeah. Oh no, it's all good. I can still hear you over there. All right. All right, Val. We are good to go up here. All right. Look around, poke our head. Um, I'm actually seeing some stuff that would be worth grabbing, I think, right now. Um, 
good call. Actually, it's probably big. Uh, would it be all right if we turn the lasers on? They're they're on. They're just to the right of the rock with the coral on it. Uh, oh, they're there. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's let's take a look around. Uh, what I was looking at as candidates, I think, are too big. Roger that. Yeah, let's not do that too early. <laughs> yeah, no, I I agree. Yeah, I think if we follow the the toe of this uh, or follow the edge of this lava flow, um, we'll have a really good chance of finding something. Roger that. Kind of crazy. It came down right on the edge of this. I know. Some good I'm navigation right there. It is. Absolutely. Did you guys already take a look at that? I don't know if it matters. It's just a little red thing. Oh, I see it. Yeah. You might be able to do a flyby or something on that. Sorry. Um, where was it? There. Oh, just, just if, a it's, little if it's convenient to do a little zoom in on that, but if not, it's fine. Sure. I like this this coral just hanging out. Yeah. We could do a quick. Looks like a sea star right zoom. there. Sea star. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. And Thank I think a right. dead sponge between the coral and the potential sea star. The coral is probably another hemichorallium mm -hmm. with a urealid in it. Um, not sure how close you guys want to get to this, but since we're here, nope. go ahead and just push on in there, please. And it looks like there's a skeleton of like a Walteria sponge on the yeah. back left. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. You so want a better right. shot of that or just it's all good? Wait, boy, please. Anyone in one of the guy, this guy here as well? Sure. While we're here. All right, go ahead and push on it. Maybe a little further. I can square you up a little bit better. Do, do, do. Look at all those polyps out. Sorry. Any more than one that guy? Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, looks like hemichorallium. Okay. Okay, thanks. Great, pull away, please. Shrimp blown in the breeze. <laughs> Lila, what is that on the coral? Uh, basket, basket star. star. Mm -hmm. All right. So are we seeing like two different basket stars um, or do they get kind of more yeah, definitely as they lots grow. of different kinds. Okay. I'm going to come towards you there a bit, Kylie. Raj, Raj. Yeah, it looks like there's a few more of those small sea stars. So you're looking for a loose rock on kind of on the edge of this flow? Yeah. Looked like further to the right maybe there were some. Yeah, I don't know. I might not have the leash for further to the right, mm. but I got the leash for all the way to the left. <laughs> yeah, we'll okay. see what's there then. <laughs> <laughs> Good choice. <laughs> Another bubblegum coral thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think bigger. I think they're uh, loose. Yeah, Oops. these look okay. What about these guys down here? I think they are loose. Mm. Val, what do you think about like uh, in here? These are a little smaller. Are they too small? It might be too small. Um, that's a potential one, but I think I'm seeing more. Oop, that way. Should probably <laughs> use the arrow to tool. <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like the hand-drawn ones. So it's uh, yeah. more sincere. <laughs> so we had a question about why we're not taking push cores as often lately. There has not been enough sediment for a push core anywhere. Yeah. Back up a little bit. Pretty much been over lava flows like this the whole time with maybe the little like fields of smaller pebbly nodule looking. Those are things. loose as well, I think. Ooh, hey, those sponges. Is that sponge alive still? I don't yeah, think well, so. Oh, the, wow. Those sponge. rocks are loose if... Those yeah, are dead. He's like yeah, yeah, there are lots of these. here? Dead sponges. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah, they're. I wonder what the story is there. I think some of those rocks look pretty, pretty loose. We can poke at them. Sure thing. Cool. Maybe. 
Now that we're looking at them a bit closer, they look a bit consolidated, but... I wonder what we're going to see higher up, if there are going to be a lot of these, like, Walteria-type sponges. Oh, that'd be cool. I'll, you might be right. It's a good bet. Yeah, I don't know. Do you see anything up there? These looks? look pretty intact, yeah, actually. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. Let's let's keep moving, then. Yes. Rog. Hi, Asako. How are you? We have several comments about our video feed getting glitchy. Oh. Not on our end, I don't think. Uh, it might be something uh, with the data stream out. Yeah, this stuff is all pretty locked in. Yeah. Oh, what about this guy? Yeah. Oh, it is that little one. That one's squat good. lobster. Yeah, yeah, that might be a <laughs> ticket. That looks. There's Ooh, another yeah. one right at the bottom of the screen too. Those Do you want the one on the lasers or the one bottom screen? Let's take a look at the one on, uh, that the lasers are on. Roger. Would that be big enough for you, like 12 centimeters? Yeah, that that should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And a few questions about why we're using two ROVs. Um, Atlanta is. Uh, All right, go ahead and push it on there, please. I think that's free. Looks, looks angular. Free. Yeah, it looks loose to me. Should be a. That should be a pretty easy grab. Yeah, I think so. A okay. Shrimp, shrimp under there. Out, yeah. Shrimp. Shrimp. Who's coming? All right. Yeah, well, we'll like take a this guy. fragment. Yeah, let's cool go for ideas. it. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of crust is on there. So far, it's been so minor. Are going to grab this guy? Except for you know, the, the starboard bio, correct? Uh, starboard bio. Yes. One of the small starboard bios. A. Raj. Or D. Whatever. This so is sample 33. Oh, you want to come up on the delta there a bit? Oh, I guess it's red. So the ROV Argus is, or Atlanta today, sorry, is tethered to our ship, and you'll notice that in the Argus view, tends to rise and fall the way the ship does at the surface. It gives us kind of a bird's eye view of what Hercules is doing down the bottom, but also um, kind of protects Hercules from that jerking up and down of the cable so it can have a nice steady view so we can do sampling like this. Am I a bit far away for you? I'm going to hop up a little bit. If you it's want cool to, to watch in the Argus view, in the Atalanta view. The right. manipulator is sampling this. Hopping up. Raj. Leela, you calling that a, another hemichorallium, probably? I think that's hemichorallium. So these are precious coral, yeah. All right, Kylie. I'll just fly it here. I'm up on it Mongo. It doesn't have so. the, quite the same, like, bulbousy polyp structure as Paragorgia. Okay. You're clear. Ooh, a little McCrurid passed by over the Argus view. And do a little zoom there on Hurt, please. That's good. Raj. Is that a chitin on the left, that white thing? Well, maybe. Uh, maybe. It does kind of look like it. It could be a connection point, too, but it does look more chitin doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Is that kind of like uh, what we were seeing yesterday? Oh, beautiful. Is this what you want there, Val? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Gonna Can we uh, rotate that when we get the, when it's... <coughs> Which uh, number it will be, sample? Uh, it'll be 
There we go. I'm gonna come up a bit. Um, if we collect a rock for Beth. Do you wanna do a zoom there on her, please? That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I bet that little skinny part is gonna be all crest. Yeah. You're up SPL. Great. Thanks for the spin. Yeah. Thanks. You're good with it? I think so. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a little skinny, um, but it's not like the pancake rock that we picked up uh yesterday where that ended up being mostly manganese. But yeah, we'll see what's in it. Boy. I think we should look for another rock around here uh, for by. Beth. Yep. That, that'll give us some redundancy just in case. All that. Um, uh, can you come wide on Argus, please? Cool. Yeah. Interested as to why. Interesting. Oop. Do you want to come up, please, on this, Kylie? Uh oh. And even if that ends up being dominantly manganese crust, we still that have scientists very, very interesting. interested. Mm -hmm. Sorry. What's that? All right. Stand by. Keep coming up, though. Interesting that I fell off like that. I don't see a lot of current, but I don't have any control of my thrusters right now. Stand by. You want back road again? Anyone, Jess? Who's? We got a shout out to the Telestrator. People are liking that. Mm. Okay.
We're having some technical issues with Herc right now. Please stand by.
If you're just joining us, we're having some technical issues with Hercules that we're trying to work out. Thank you for your patience. Sorry, Val. That's okay. Um, if if we can't recover that one, uh, we'll we'll look for something else to pick up. Uh, I'd like to get a sample for Beth uh, somewhere around here too, if we see something. Roger. Yeah, Val. Sorry, we were we're fixing a lot of operational things moving around. We can pick that rock okay. back up. Uh, I'll back up Kylie and grab it. Yeah, no worries. Um, Gonna come I'm, around the front. I'm glad that things seem to be uh, behaving now. Actually, we'll see. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll see then. <laughs> we will roll with it. Yeah. <laughs> you want to come around a little bit more, Carly? Actually, are any of these rocks here good for you? <laughs> <laughs> or is that a negative? Let's poke at a couple of them, see if they're loose. Reg. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm really loud. Oh, you're, you're, you're perfect. Okay. Um, you want to tell us straight anything that looks? Yeah, lower left. Yeah. Is that loose? Yeah, maybe that well, one. Well, I, I don't know, yeah. And if that's in place, that might be loose too. Is the iris open on um, Herc? That's good. This this one the that one. My fingers are over? Uh, yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think those are all cemented in there, Kylie. I think so, too. But I owe Val a good rock. Uh, yeah, I think that's we'll find something. You'd be surprised. Let's see. I don't mind poking. We can also just back up a little bit, Val, and get the other rock that we... Okay. Um, Um, is this one next to it loose at all? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Maybe. Oh, it looks like oh, it. Yeah, it's, it's way yes. Good. All Maybe right. Get a better grip on that guy. No. Nice. Excellent. Another swirl and twirl. Go ahead and push on in there, but they're at. Okay. Yeah, that looks like a pillow fragment. I think that's Even better, better than the first one. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 Happy. She did that purposely. I'm really <laughs> sorry, Val. <laughs> No, don't don't okay. apologize for it. I, I think this is a way better sample, actually. Okay, because it, it doesn't have that pointy, flattish side of it. Yeah, yeah. This definitely More has uh, basalt in it. So, okay. um, yeah, okay. I think uh, this would be a good one for Beth too. Um, okay. So, where would it go then? Starboard A for Val first, right? You want this one, and then we'll look for another one for Beth. Um. Or yeah, we could do that. Or what did you? Could, what or, were you thinking? Uh. When Beth is uh, uh, Beth has been sampling her her stuff and then uh, hands it over to me, so it would be oh, suitable for both. Could do both. Yeah. Okay, so that means it needs to go in the forward. Yeah, let's put it in the forward. Okay. Roger, can you come wide on um, Herc, please? We're gonna put it in the forward. They want it for Beth. Put yeah. it in forward. Lambda. Did you hear me, Trevor? I used lambda. <laughs> Could you translate for uh, what that means Le for me? <laughs> A, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're um, full rack back right now. Roger. Just as a placeholder, when we're done with all of the geology, Asako is asking if there's a couple corals we could zoom in on before we move. Yeah, sure I think we can do that. Oh, yeah. Look at that. So clear. Raj. Okay, white fan too. Yeah. Mm. 
That's a, I think, a pretty good size, too. Yeah. Nice. Another but net. Okay, Beautiful. so Suleiman will move 033 to here. Yep, I'll delete the old one. Perfect, thank you. Thanks. And then, uh, yeah, when the pilots are ready, uh, let's fire a Niskin for the paired sample. Oh, Raj, uh, Niskin, gotcha. Yep, thank you. Niskin. Yeah. yeah, this one may also have some eDNA usage given we have a few different species hanging out around here. Hmm. Kyle, I want to redo the dive salvo for some reason. It's sure. not coming up proper. There we go. Port real cam is up. Uh, I need to re index. Get eyes, Roger. So we are taking a water sample to go along with the rock sample we just got off the bottom. That'll be used by uh, Beth Orcutt, who is one of our two lead scientists on board. Let's just do a different one. Yeah, yeah, six to choose from. Yeah. Um, are you planning on starting in the middle somewhere? I, I think I'm going to start with number uh, two. Uh, two. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to re-index and uh, set up again, because I think that'll help. So back row, just as Kylie finishes up the water sample, um, what we were experiencing is actually super high currents down here. Mm. Like so much that we're not, we're full thrust down, full thrust forward, and we're barely holding spot. Wow. Okay. So we might not get very good visual, uh, good imaging data, but we will. We will try our hardest. Okay. But if it's a little shaky, uh, my got apologies. It. I got eyes. Okay. And it's fired. Uh, Leela, that was Niskin 1. Niskin 1? Yes. Sweet. Thanks Thank you. for that update, Jess. Uh, yeah. Well, um, Asako was hoping we could do a zoom on the long whip coral. Sure. And then after that, the white fan. Sure thing. Uh, there we go. I'm assuming she means this whip here. And. Do we, Val, did you want another rock sample for yourself? I think it's going to be a dual purpose rock. I think so. Raj, Raj. Okay. Okay. Yeah, you can really see the coral swaying in that current. All right. And I'm going to need a second to finish up sampling stuff before I can take pictures of that coral. Roger that. I'll get set up there. It might take us a second anyway. Perfect. Uh, we had a question about the rock samples that we took um, yesterday. How did those turn out? Uh, those turned out really cool. <laughs> uh, so we saw a few different rock types yesterday. Um, at the beginning of the dive, uh, the rocks... Uh, turned out to be uh, something that was not basalt. Uh, looks like something that differentiated from basalt into a different composition with uh, much higher silica. Hey Jess, I apologize. Uh, Sako just clarified there's some long whips to the right that I hadn't seen um, until just a second ago. Raj. They're not just out of camera view. Sure thing. Sorry guys. Uh, yeah. Um, about mid-dive we were picking there up There we go. Basalt Those big ones. Okay. Oh wow. Looks like they've been predated upon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody was hungry. All right, let's do that. It looks sort of bamboo corally, but we'll only see when we see the skeleton. Yeah, we went up a ridge, and we started off with the 
some rock types that kind of sat around for a while. Uh, back into the basalts that we see a lot of on these kinds of dives. And then uh, when we got uh, to waypoint eight, which was the uh, end of our uh, planned dive track, um, in that area, uh, the highest we were stratigraphically on the ridge. And we saw something called hyaloclastite, which is a uh, uh, volcano sedimentary deposit. And that um, I was suspecting was related to uh, the volcanic plumbing system. Uh, so that might have been like a major uh, volcanic edifice. So we had a lot going on. All right, go ahead and push on in there, please. All right. Do you want to tie it up on the polyp one type of shot? Ooh. Yeah, it looks yeah. like a bamboo. We got and that squall obster. There are multiple squall yeah. lobsters going for a ride. <laughs> oh, there's those pink ones. Okay, so coaster. it is a bamboo coral. Sure thing. Sorry, you can I'll see the little black delineations in its skeleton. Sorry. Asako's asking if this is the first bamboo we've seen this cruise. Yeah, we haven't seen any bamboos on the previous two dives. Yeah, we were cruising kind of fast sometimes, so yeah, it's possible it we missed some. But I, had, I didn't see anything that looked yeah, super distinctly. Yeah. Or at least not, not often. It wasn't dominant. A dead sponge in the foreground. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are all these like dead Walteria. It doesn't seem like any, any of them are still alive. Did you guys want me to square it better on this, or is that all right? Um, that's probably all right. I can. There we go. We got lucky there. <laughs> That's kind of tilt. Uh, you can go ahead and push on in a bit more there, please. It's kind of like how these lobsters just hang around with their with their arms out. It's like a focus game for you too, right? Hey. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Oh, that <laughs> awesome. Nice job, Rhett. That was that looks nice. I think those are Cairo stylet squat lobsters. Okay. Great. Thanks. All right, Floyd. And. Asako, you had mentioned a white fan. It's probably to the lower left Is that there. The one? Oh. Um, or is it the one on the right? Or? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it could be these. Those are white. There's that kind of pinkish one on the left. Paracorgia yeah. to the right, she's saying. Do, do you want the left, lower left one there? So or this one here, I think, is what she's talking one. about. Oh, oh Raj. That looks like the ones we were seeing last Go ahead dive. Go push on in there, please. The E name that oh. I didn't remember. I think I have it wrong. <laughs> but um, let's get this one anyways. Yeah. There's, we got a few things we can look at here. Do you want bump down here? Um, sorry. I didn't see a paragorgid, but if we zoom back out, maybe. Wow, that is some crust. Yeah. Definitely some manganese crust here. I, I'm i not going to make any guesses how I thick that is. that's good though. there, Jess. All right, full away, please. And then, what other ones? Um, would you mind pa panning left a little bit? I'll, I'll yeah. take a look. I don't see it, the paracord that she's talking about. Maybe, like, way in the back, those pink ones. There is a, it looks like a, to the lower left, is that the one? Mm. That fan-shaped? That one's not paragorgia. Mm -hmm. Like, only the super pink ones might be. Sacco says the yellow fans to the left would be black coral. That's staropathies, I think. If we want to zoom on the yellow coral, we can. That's the one you were talking about earlier. Okay. This one here? Uh, yep, the yellow orangey one right there below the lasers. All right, go ahead and push on in there, please. Yeah, I think that's staropathies. Get a little bump down here. If you want me to get a little closer to it, let me know. I think that's okay. And then we have Chrysogorgids on the left. Yeah. Oh, look at that little, uh, I don't know if it's a, not an anemone, but a hydro, hydrozoan or something on it. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, there's cool, a thanks. All right, pull away, please. Excellent. Yeah, it's a really pretty Chrysogorgid bottle brush there, just to the left of what we looked at. Oh, yeah. Such cool structures. All right. Anything else in the stream, or else I'll. Oh, keep this is the around. one she means. Can we? Can we actually? It looks like she'd like a snap uh, zoom of the on, that, on the bottle brush. Yeah, on the Chrysogorgia. That's the one that's to the left of the orange. Yeah. Okay. Sure thing. I'll get a little closer. That doesn't have any light on it. Thanks, Asaka. We got finally we're getting there. <laughs> Thanks for your patience, and Jess too. Yeah. Have we seen uh, this bottle brush on any of the previous dives? Yeah, we've been seeing a lot of the a okay. lot of Chrysogorgids that are sort of this morphology. 
Okay. Yeah, I knew we were seeing a couple. I just wasn't recalling mm -hmm. the morphology off the top of my head. Okay. Ah, and the fan to the left, right next to it. Leela, can you look at the science chat and see if that's what she, you think she's um, talking about? All right, go ahead and push on in there again, please. Oh, this is not yeah. You want them both in the same shot? Sure, here yeah. we okay. go. Um, yeah, maybe we could zoom a little more on the fan to the left. Fan to the left, Raj. I'm going to do a little bit of a heading change. Ooh, I can go Actually, back out for you, sorry. Yeah, you want to come a little out? Actually, maybe we can just make people a little seasick for a sec. Oh, it looks great. All right, go ahead and push on in there again, please. If we could zoom as far as it goes. All right, you're you're all clear to. Oh, Reg, is that <laughs> it? <laughs> okay. You want me to get closer? Uh, I think Asako was trying to figure out if that was a bamboo coral or a primnoid. I do, don't think it looks like a bamboo coral. Yeah, I don't see any nodes. I don't know. It's kind of hard to tell. It was like, no, I don't think there's anything obvious there. Uh, they're like a couple black lines that. Happy wondering, but <laughs> she's, she's it doesn't really look like a primnoid either. Yeah, she's saying bamboo. Really? You want me to get a little closer? Maybe, sure. Pull wide, please. I see like a couple little black lines down at the base it's, there. Yeah, it's hard to tell. Yeah, Ryan agrees. Uh, he thinks bamboo too. Okay, Steve also. Okay. Skeleton banding subtle. Yeah, I know. You can see like a couple in interspersed black lines. Majority decides. Go ahead and push on in there, please. Uh. Further? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Ooh. sorry if I blew you out there. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. Is that all the way in? That is. Yeah, you can kind of see it. Yeah, like on the center, center branch. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Full wide, please. We had a question about whether Hercules has a way to record current speeds. Mm, no, it's primarily visual. Um, all right, Val, what are you thinking for heading? Yeah, let's. Uh, I think it's time to get a move. Uh, start heading toward uh, waypoint two. Um, kind of speed are we looking at here? We'll probably do a little bit slower, especially if we're going to be countering a lot of currents. Yeah, so point two knot okay? Yeah, the rocks. Okay. Yes. Are you ready for it? Oh, let's get out of this spot. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So it will be on bearing 320? 320, Raj. Bridge, this is enough. Can we make a move on bearing 320, 50 meters on speed uh, 0 0.2 knots. There was a, a lot of thank you. appreciation of the diversity of coral that we're seeing. In this yeah, there's pack. a lot, like yeah. not a ton of stuff, but they're all really different. Like there's that heteropolypus mushroom coral, What's the bright yellow one? the hemichorallium, that's a crinoid. Ready to fly away in the current practice. There's a lot <laughs> living on yeah, all these dead bacteria. I'm actually the bridge not flying zero point two right really that's the current. speed. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. See ya. Thank you. Is that a Walteri there, Leela? The yeah, there? they're all dead, I think. Yeah. That one looks like maybe alive. This one maybe. Not yeah. looking too lively, no. There's something living in uh, that yeah, one, maybe though. It, does it have might a be. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Sorry, you wanted to look at this Volteria here? Just like a quick zoom if it's alive or not. Reg, you just square <laughs> Man, that one actually looks better than some of the others. Different every dive. <laughs> nice That's the driving. cool thing. These seamounts are just these little microcosms when it comes to ecosystems. It does look like it's browning a little bit, though, doesn't it? Go ahead and push on in there, please. Yeah, yeah it doesn't I, look very happy. I don't think it's super happy. Uh, no? No, <laughs> oh, <you're> at Associates. <laughs> <laughs> I was having a bad day. <laughs> so yesterday was like this, the seamount of sponges, Thanks. and this one's like the anti-sponge seamount so far. Yeah. All right, pull wide, please. 
I had a question oh, about. another one of those green blobby things, which actually I was looking at Chris's list, and Chris yesterday was also having all the same guesses about like, is this a tunicate? Is this a a um, you want to push on in there a little bit, please? But look at on his wish list. Are you talking about this? Yeah, yeah. look at it on his w wish list. This Apostola yeah, Sclerida, Apostola Sclerida, Sclerida, and that is a chitin too, I think. Oh yeah. Um, Can you want to turn on the porch light there a little bit? Yeah. Oh, Orange. sorry, I'm drifting around a bit. Can I come a little wide, please? Sure. Okay. All right, go ahead and push on in there again. Is that any help to see what that is? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't think it looks like a tunicate. It looks more spongy. Hmm. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, pull cool. away, please. Looks like it would be challenging to sample that. Ah, it could be slurp a and scrape, scrape and slurp. Yeah, <laughs> we like those. Something Sounds to think about. That could be a good bio collection later on. Okay. We had a question about whether we know our dive Whoa. schedule for next week, and short answer is no. We're not quite sure. There's a lot of factors that go into that, so we're always planning and then replanning as conditions warrant. Yeah, we had this. Uh, the set of dives for those crews all carefully mapped out and the weather was like um uh, we'll, we'll we'll see about that <laughs> yeah the captain said there's still at least a few more days up into the weekend of, of rough weather down south of us so mm -hmm. i think we'll yeah. have to kind of wait and see how things play out i'm sure we'll do as many dives as we can though and uh, i mean we're out here we need to make the most <laughs> of our time right yeah, but yeah. there's yeah. still a lot of this dead sponge that's a primnoid. Oh, so much more loose rock than yesterday. Right. Yeah, that stuff's. So that white disc we saw was a chitin, correct? Yes, it was, which is a kind of mollusk. So they're kind of related to snails. You can think about that bottom foot like, like the snail foot and the top part sort of like the shell, except they have a bunch of um, like plated, plate, plate shell, plated sections as part of their shell. Is that some more black coral there, that orangish brown? I think yeah, we saw some that earlier. Another star pathies. Sorry, it's cleared up again here. Boy, you do have kind of uh, the pick of the litter there, Val. <laughs> You're good for now. Literally <laughs> a litter. Yeah, um, I, I think we're good for the moment, and we'll uh, once we start. Excuse me. Once we start getting a little closer to waypoint two, we'll uh, we'll see what we have geologically there, or not. I did see one living sponge to our right. Not that we have to stop and look at it. But it's nice to see one that still looks pretty bright. <laughs> especially after the sponge kingdom yesterday. What is going on over here? An anemone. Is that it? Oh, oh that's, that's one of those like tail. Yeah. Those oh, yeah. Okay. What should I call it? It's bamboo whips? Yeah. And that I is like that guy. yellow. Oh, that's a pom-pom. Oh, wait. No, no, no. That's not a pom-pom uh, anemone. That is, what are those called again? Go ahead and push that in there, please. Uh, I want to say Rigadrella, but that's a that's a, a sponge. Um, Do you have to be able to see its mouth to totally identify it, or no? No. This one is ah. Well, it's just telling me Serianthaeria, but I could have sworn there was one more specific name somewhere. I love the way this thing moves in the current. Yeah. This is our flow indicator. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> right. Just getting jiggy with it. <laughs> cool. Pull away, please. Kind of belongs at a metal show. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I have a question asking why are sponges white? Why not? <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I don't know. <laughs> Serianthaeria. That this actually looks like the Serianthaeria on Chris's wish list, sort of. Um, are we moving right now? We are currently okay. moving. Yeah. Cool. Maybe keep an eye out for those in the future. Sorry, I need to get myself sorted out here. That's on his list. I wonder if I'm missing a page. This one right here. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know if I have that one on here. Another bathopathies in the back. Mm -hmm. Are you fighting really hard against this? Oh. Mm. Yeah, it looks like the other image of that Ser Serentharia was in the Line Islands. Mm. Yeah, that's quite a bit south of here. South and a little bit east. Next move will be the same. Three three zero, but we'll do it. Bridge, this is not. Another move on bearing three three zero, fifty meters, please. I have a question about the guides Thank that you. we're using. Um, Justin, can you mention where you're getting the guides that we used to identify cool. these species? With a sponge. Oh uh, well, with we have thing on top. Mm -hmm. one guide that was kind of pulled from various other guides of things that Dr. Chris Kelly was particularly looking for um, that needed further uh, ID work. Um, but if folks want to go to um, NOAA Benthic Animal ID, that'll pull up. One of the one of the good guides for this deep deep ocean fauna. So that wish list is for Internal. our whole our whole cruise, not just day to day, right? Yeah. Still a lot of a lot of dead sponges coming from somewhere. I think we went over this earlier. That looks a little familiar. Um, yeah, we were kind of close over here, but now we're in new okay. territory. Okay. Yeah. Wow, look at this slope. Must be where about where the uh, lava flow must have truncated. Steve Oskovich is saying that the white fans that we've been looking at are Cryptelia, specifically Cryptelia kelly -y. Uh, named after Dr. Chris Kelly, which was described from samples collected in the monument in 2017. And then the Analepsamia, which was what we were seeing yesterday, too. I'm glad you can pronounce that one. <laughs> I don't know that I'm doing it right. <laughs> wow, well, Val, what happened here? This is just like looks like the top of a sheet flow and we went over the nose of it where um, where the lava may have stalled so it was a good thing we uh, grabbed a rock when we did it also looks like it's much more exposed here so um, maybe less favorable for uh, uh, some of these corals to uh, uh, anchor themselves which is more exposed to current and stuff Whereas uh, b below this uh, lava flow, it looks like things were a little bit more sheltered. Jess, is this you right now fighting against, trying to fight against the current to move up? Yeah, that's true. That's wow. correct. Okay. I do like doing the sail test, though. It's like <laughs> a kind of fun. It's like, no stick. And then you're like, woohoo, <laughs> see ya. <laughs> <laughs> and to see how fast we can drift. Wow. <laughs> These corals must be feeling a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have, is, have there been dives where we've had to recover the vehicles because of current? 
I haven't been on one that was this strong. Uh, no, usually don't recover. It's just um, we might like tow. Oh yeah, just stream behind. The okay. Yeah, but um, I think that Kingsman Reef Palmyra Atoll. You guys were dealing. With, I'm not sure who was on then, but they were dealing with some stronger currents. Kylie was on that. Yeah. On the bottom, no, but on the surface, yes. Oh, the surface. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot emphasize that enough. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's just like the way that the sea floor is laid out that it channels flow in a very strong way. Yeah, kind of like in uh, cities too, between uh, skyscrapers. Oh yeah, wind tunnels. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, in the winter, in New York City. Growing up, that was just like the bane of my existence. You'd get out of the subway, be slipping all over the place, and the like icy, snowy wind is just <laughs> channeled into your face between the skyscrapers. It was horrible. Asako is asking us to quick zoom the bottom. I think they're barnacles. On the barnacles? Oh, yeah. Kind of like on the first dive. Oh, yeah. Roger that. That's what she wanted to ascertain. Maybe I just like get a stable here. Wow, a two-knot equatorial undercurrent. That's okay. moving. Yeah, so uh, Steve Do you want to go ahead and push on in there, please? Hmm, yeah, actually not barnacles. So yeah. Little, I don't know. Bryozoan, or I have no idea. Is that a little mollusk there, Leela? Looks like oh, it. Oh, yeah, a little gastropod of some kind. Just a little thing. All right, is that good for, yeah, for a short? Yeah, thanks. Great, so. pull away, please. Yep. Officially not barnacles. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that rock <laughs> is almost glassy over there. Oh yeah, yeah. These, these are these really smooth, like, really solid manganese crusts. Yeah, arborescent foraminifera, that's the term I was looking for. You can get some of these different textures and, like, different, I don't know, like, robustness uh, on, on some of these manganese crusts in different parts of the ocean, where some of them are, like, really well consolidated, like what we're seeing here. Then there's some other places where uh, you pull up rocks with manganese crusts and, you know, some of them are so fragile that, you know, it feels like you just look at them and they start to fall apart. <laughs> a question for our pilots. How does one become an ROV pilot? How do you start that process? That is really hard to answer but no okay so there's a lot of different paths to doing this um and they are like the the diversity of the people doing this job makes us all like a well-informed um workforce so there's like lots of different ways you can get here and it can be through academic pursuit and it can be through um like the um, like technical side, trade side of things. Um, but what I would encourage any person listening that's interested to do is like look on the nautiluslive.org website at the core of exploration biographies at people in the positions that you're interested in and see w what their careers looked like because they're so varied um, and they're these people that have worked on the ship are from all over the globe. So um, different things may be more accessible to you. Um, Bridget, this is enough. So I... Uh, another move, same step, please. So I think that's like a really good resource for anyone that's like how do I do that because like the rungs and the ladder are different for everyone but you can get here in a multitude of ways um, so do things that are genuinely interesting to you um, and um, 
and then like look at that resource and, and find mentorship and volunteer. And then like the Nautilus also has a um, internship program. That is how I got started out. Like once I finished my community college associate's degree, I had got placed with the Nautilus Live ROV engineering internship. Um, and I've been, I've done five seasons now as a contractor with the Nautilus and I work in industry on other ships. Um, but like it's a meandering path and um, lots of different ways you can uh, qualify yourself. We'll answer. Thanks. One of our uh, onshore experts, uh, Kira, who works on uh, manganese crusts, is telling is telling us that, uh, that these uh, these crusts can get super shiny in uh, high currents like these. Ooh, and that's uh, a little bit Hiding. of an erosive feature. Fish. I guess the currents are kind of polishing the crusts. Yeah, the um, Nautilus Live page has really added a lot on careers, and there's video pieces in there. There's a, there's a lot of good information, and kind of it makes it feel more real, mm -hmm. like attainable. So I, I would I would echo what Kylie's saying. Just it's definitely worth spending some time looking around and hearing people's stories, seeing yourself in that. You want to hear something silly? Always. Whenever I see myself on the Nautilus stuff, I'm like, oh my god, I'm really doing it. Yeah. Right. Like, I'm like, oh my god, it's not a fluke. <laughs> like, this is my job. This is real. It's like, to see your, your actual self doing it, I'm like, it's still... Because when you come out here, it's like a little bit like a fever dream. <laughs> um, and then when you get to see evidence of it after the fact, when you're in your regular life, you're like, oh, wow, I did a thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is pretty surreal sometimes out here. Yeah. It's just so different from just kind of every day, whatever, what, you know, whatever we do. I can't wait to tell my grandkids I did this, you know, like your grandma. Was studying a sea floor with robots. <laughs> <laughs> How cool is that? I know, I can't wait. The funny thing is, that'll be like the clunky car phone. Totally. <laughs> Back in my day, <laughs> <laughs> we had cable ROVs. <laughs> we sat in a van. They're going to live in an underwater city and just be completely unimpressed. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why that's what I sound like when I'm old, but that's... That's what we all sound like when we're <laughs> thinking we're going to be old. <laughs> oh, we just saw a fish of some sort. See oh, that? I, I was just reading the science chat. I missed it. Uh, the fisher is kind of just cruising with the current, too. The science team ashore is... Uh, talking about that anemone we saw. Yeah, consensus, relicanthus. I was trying to remember with the one with the R, not Rigadrella, relicanthus. And it was not the one, not what we're looking to collect. Apparently you can tell okay. because the one that we want to collect would have inner tentacles also that we didn't see. Got a lot of layback. Yeah, a lot. It's from that current. Yeah, buddy. It's like 150 meters of layback. Yeah. Oh. Uh, we got another Nautilus pun. Uh oh. She's not like the other girls. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm <of> not. <laughs> <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> That took a second too. Man, these are good. <laughs> Just gotta twist the brain a little bit. Yeah. Gotta see it written down, really. <laughs> yeah. So we have a viewer asking, what is the most exciting thing we have seen on a dive? Man. How do I you love. choose? Yeah. 
That trip, that, that thing, that thing yesterday that we all saw, the big um, bubblegum coral with all those uh, oh. 